Hey everybody, how's it going? I'm Chase Jarvis. Welcome to another episode of Chase Jarvis Live here on Creative Live. You're tuned into the 30 Days of Genius series. Boy, if you're new to the series, let me tell you a little bit about it. It's where I sit down with the world's top creatives, entrepreneurs, and thought leaders and extract actionable insights that you can apply to your day-to-day to help you live your dreams in career, hobby, and in life. If you're new to the series, all you gotta do is go to creativelive.com slash 30 days of genius, the number three zero days of genius. Click that blue button and then you get one of these badass interviews in your inbox every day for 30 days. My guest today is an actor, a producer, a director, all around Hollywood man. He is an advocate for social good like few others I know on the planet. And you probably know him also as the star of, boy, Entourage, the however many seasons they've had on HBO, and the summer blockbuster that just dropped last summer, Mr. Vinny Chase on that series. My guest is Adrian Grenier. Hi, bud. Hey, hey. I'm great. Man. Welcome to you? Seattle. Dude, it's been too long. It has been. It's been way too long. We're, you're in my hood right now. I usually see you in New York. I know. That's Welcome. right. Or, or wherever. Where, yeah, actually Sundance or LA. or. But you're in Seattle, and I know what you're doing here, but I kind of want to save that for a little bit, the, the, yeah. the thing that hmm, we said we were going to. There is a, a, a guest is going to be making, I mean, we have a guest, but there's going to be actually another guest. It's the first time in this whole series that we're going to have two people on that couch. We're going to save that to the end. That's the crescendo. Um, in the meantime, welcome to Seattle. Thank you. And, geez, you've been busy. Shit, you've been super busy. I have, yes. So, one of the things that we were talking about before we started rolling the cameras was, before we talk about, I think most people want to talk about Hollywood, I want to talk about your advocacy for social good. You spent a lot of time uh, with organizations like SHIFT, the Lonely Whale Foundation, but what does it mean in your world to be an advocate, and you're also connected with Dell or some, some like, right? Yeah. What, what does it mean to be an advocate of social good? Um, what does it mean? <laughs> well, it's, it's pretty straightforward. You gotta, you know, think about people and communities and the planet, and the work you do is to support um, human beings in the, in the earth. Do you act so that you have that platform, or because you act, you have that platform, therefore you're using it for social good? Uh, I guess because I had a good mother who raised me well is why I do that. Yeah. I've seen a lot of pictures. You, you take a lot of pictures with your mom. I like that. I am definitely a mommy's boy. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, that, she definitely shaped me and inspired me. And, you know, it, it created a sense of um, ownership and accountability within me. Uh, you know, it started with very basic skills like cleaning my room. You know, it's very, very simple. Uh, idea that I think most people would agree with. You gotta teach children how to respect their own environment, except now our environment is a you know, whole planet. So we have to clean our room together. Clean our room. I like it. Uh, let's get, it's just, we're gonna naturally parlay that into family talk. So only child, brothers, sisters. Only child, uh, although I do have two, my, my father uh, has two daughters that I did not grow up with, but are still siblings. Yeah, family. Uh, uh, and, you know, my, my family is uh, mostly a chosen one. I, I've managed to, uh, to invite some really amazing people into my life, and they've become family. Um, bro- brothers, sisters, siblings, mentors, role models. And I, and I like to live that way, where, uh, you know, your, your family bleeds out into the the, the larger community. I, you send that. Mass, I feel that, like your your house uh, in Brooklyn. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's like a it's a mishmash of a open million. Open door policy. Yeah. <laughs> be careful. <laughs> be careful. People are going to find your address. Not that open. Not that okay. open. Be no, careful. No, it, but it's true. I've I've made a point to create, you know, a really open environment where people can come and enjoy my 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 space because I travel a lot, so I'm never there. Yeah. I have a great house. And I want people to be able to use it. I don't want it to just be empty, collecting dust, you know, costing me, you know, money. I want to actually be able to share it with, with my friends, family, travelers, uh, entrepreneurs that I, that I come across. Um, it's sort of like friend B&B. Uh, and <laughs> which, what's Quotable. really cool is I'm actually accumulating a guest. Points? Points? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
I'd be winning if, if I was. No, it's a guest log. Oh, wow. So I, um, I make, I don't make, but I highly suggest, and considering the fact that they're staying uh, virtually for free. Uh, virtually? You just charge them a fiver or uh, something? Well, no, I, they have to contribute. They have to, you know. Ah, make they, their, make, clean their room. They have to it. leave the place nicer than they found it. There's some, awesome. some certain rules. Um, and one of the rules is they have to leave a video blog or a oh video log, rather. I should say log. So instead of signing the guest book, it's a video guest book. <laughs> so I had people, like all different types of people, uh, leaving little video messages, often you know, thank, thanking me for letting them stay, but just getting to know who they are, why they're in the city, why they're, you know, where they're off to, and families and uh, you know, entrepreneurs and artists and all different kinds of people. Uh, even some, some military guys, I spent some time, uh, I was actually on a, a, a submarine recently, a nuclear oh, wow. submarine working uh, with the Navy. Uh, so I had some of those guys staying at my house. Nice. So just a wide range. And you That's can ask awesome. me why I was on a nuclear submarine a little later, but okay. it's related to the project that we weren't going to talk about. We will talk about that. I'm looking at the guest that we're going to have on here in just a second. There she is. <laughs> She's got a great oh, smile. Oh, you can see what we saw. Right now. <laughs> um, so actually, the the related to your house and but different than I'll say Hollywood is the rec room. Mm -hmm. Tell me about the rec I mean, I know a little bit about it. Tell the folks at home about the rec room. Well, you know, I've, I've built a lot of uh, little businesses, really, which are all designed to create community and really to give people the tools to be more of what they are, what they want to be, more human, so that they can uh, really start to manifest and articulate the, the instincts that I think that I presume we all have, which is sure. compassion and connecting with others and giving back and um, being creative. So Rec Room is one of those, those little businesses, essentially, that have, it's, it's a studio that I built. It's in my home, and I give it to local artists and artists who are passing through to come in and write and record, make a video, and put it up online. And we encourage collaboration, mentorship, apprenticeship, and really just recognizing that not, you know, the, the industry, the, the bigger umbrella, which is the music industry. Bum, bum, bum. Uh, yeah, I mean, has, you know, they're, they're, its goals are primarily financial. Mm -hmm. And really, you lose the, the vibe and the reason why we play music. And it's really to, to communicate communicate and share and connect with others. Yeah, convene, bring people together. Yeah. Uh, well, let's talk about that a little bit because I think you know that the audience who's on the other side of this camera, they are they identify as creators or entrepreneurs or aspirationally thinking about those sorts of things as a, a lifestyle or a hobby or uh, ultimately a career. Um, what, how important, you said so many words, like you just went, you're like there's empathy, empathy and gathering people, convening, how, how um, mentorship was something that you said in there. So how important is mentorship for being a part of, well, identifying as a creative for making things? I mean, you, I think it's fair to say that you build things for a living, whether it's a script, uh, a role, a business, and, you know, what role has mentorship, what, what role do you play, and how has that played a role in shaping you? Well, we learn from each other. You know, we learn about, you know, we, we learn from others' mistakes, we learn from their, their experience, their wisdom, and it makes it easier for us to come to uh, better decisions in our own lives because we don't have to waste the learning curve of having to go through all of the mistakes that someone else has made. So it's very important to keep your, your eyes and your ears open and to listen and learn from others. Um, and it just makes, your life a lot easier when you're taking information, synthesizing it, and then building off of it, as opposed to stubbornly just wanting to, you know, go through it and learn it yourself. Although sometimes that's a good, it's fun yeah. to do as well. Uh, make your own mistakes, uh, which we all have to do as well. But um, really, it's for me, uh, it's it's really important to find a humble 
approach to your own creative work, your own business work, and to recognize you, you can't do everything yourself. And you, you can't scale if you do it alone. You really need to work with others. You need to learn from others and get excited about that process. And it's an, it's, it's, it really is a humble act, yeah. an act of being humble, but also it's, it's mostly going to benefit you in the long run. For sure. So anyone you can cite as specifically a great mentor to you or, or a shitty one, but ideally we talked about <laughs> the great ones. Anybody in particular that you want to give a shout out to? If I said you, you'd think I was just saying that. I would. But it's you. Oh, man. No, dude, I, I've, I've been you know, really impressed at how, I mean, and, and what you've built over the past several years has been really impressive. And uh, how well you speak on camera is, is really, really <laughs> this inspiring. Is, this is some shit right here. You guys recording? Oh, yeah, right. We got five cameras. Dude, you're my, you're my mentor. Thanks. You're not the only one. I get it. You're, I'll, you're, I'll, you're, I'll take it, man. I'll take one. it. Um, how about, uh, I, I don't necessarily identify um, the, and I don't want to overly stereotype, but I want to sort of make a reference, because I think there is patterns. Uh, there, there are patterns. And Hollywood um, tends to be very egocentric. Um, there is a lot of, like, and this, this is true for just, individual independent artists like you have to look out for yourself you have to be an advocate for yourself mm -hmm. and I encourage that but you have this a fascinating um, I don't know if trajectory is not the right word you have a fascinating sort of mode about you that when you're advocating for yourself or your peers say around signing a contract for the film entourage huh. or but or, or maybe even versus like but you're so you're so externally um, inclusive, empathetic. I mean, you've got all these projects that are around the ocean and around, I mean, your home. It's just the pattern that you just painted around your home is, uh, that is very un-Hollywood. So how do, you, how do you navigate that or how do you think about it? Well, I, I've learned a lot of great lessons, you know, and there's something about the Hollywood experience that I was always suspicious of. There's plenty yeah. to be suspicious well, of. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't know really why, but um, I, at a certain point I, I said, you know, I got I to gotta explore this a little bit more. And, and it was surrounding uh, my entourage experience and finding my own role in the public eye and what it was like to kind of be a little famous. Yep. and. Be, becoming famous by playing a famous guy about fame and what's this whole fame culture and celebrity culture and what's this Hollywood thing that I'm, I'm involved in and and I started to explore it and and through that exploration I ended up making a documentary called Teenage Paparazzo. Incredible. And that documentary was essentially an education. It was uh, me learning about what drives this whole Hollywood fame culture and what it is in me and people generally that, that strive for celebrity or, or feel that somehow celebrities are, have it better than the rest of us or they're, um, you know, they're, they're living the American dream that we all want. And it was through that process that I, I came to realize that, first of all, the promise of fame or that, that, that celebrity um, pitch is, is flawed. It's, it's somehow, I mean, it's a cliche that it's empty, but it's true. At the end of the day, all the th things that you receive as a celebrity, all of the things you, um, you enjoy and to in, in indulging, ultimately don't yield much fulfillment internally. And really, the cure to that is giving back and building community and, and also building real relationships, not these fake, you know, relationships to characters that are... Parasocial on, relationships. Exactly, on, in television. And, I learned and that media. term from you, speaking Parasocial. of mentorship. Exactly. <laughs> That's a, it's a, for, for, if you haven't seen Teenage... I know probably everyone out there has, but if you haven't seen Teenage Pop Rods, it's a really, it's an amazing arc where you're... Uh, well, why don't you explain it? Like, you give it what's the short pitch of Teenage Pop Rods? So I deconstructed my celebrity experience through the eyes of a young paparazzi boy, a young photographer who got caught up in the whole uh, Hollywood 
paparazzi game. And this was right in the early aughts, I guess, the beginning of the internet and, uh, you know, when- Entourage when, just- Well, Entourage was blowing yeah. up and tabloids were simultaneously yeah. becoming, you know, really uh, pervasive on the internet. TMZ had just launched, it was, you know, it was ripe for the, the, the film to, to explore. And, um, you know, and I, and I just made a decision that I was gonna pull the, pull the curtain back and reveal what it was like from the inside out and really call, call, call the industry out for Absolutely. what it is. Did you take some shit for that? Oh yeah, I did, yeah. What does the shit look like? Well, there's a lot of media uh, resistance, a lot of, you know, it's sort of the, if you look at the, the media at large, it's like, I read this great book called uh, Mediated by Thomas de Zangotita and he equates the media at large like The Blob, okay. you know, the Steve McQueen movie, yeah. The Blob, where <laughs> the more you throw at it, the bigger it gets. You try and battle it, it just absorbs it and becomes larger. Um, and the only way you can really beat The Blob is a freeze out, right? So, I mean, look at Trump, for example. Oof. I, I know. It, the more you talk about him, the bigger he gets. The more you want to try and, you know, undermine him by Saying something, it just, he just gets bigger and bigger and more uh, it just em empowered. The only way to cure the Trump problem is mm -hmm. just to ignore him and not talk about him and just fo put your focus elsewhere. Um, so I don't remember what we're talking about, but. No, it was, it was what's the sort of concept around uh, teenage paparazzo and, and were you sort of vilified for talking oh, right. about the group, the very yes. thing that has created your career. Yes. When you, well, I have this experience of revealing all of the secrets of the photography industry. And was, I was absolutely vilified mm -hmm. by saying, this is how much I make, this is how you would negotiate this, this is how I would shoot this, this is my sort of lighting setup. And this is also early aughts when it was totally, the internet was just happening. It wasn't even, it wasn't even YouTube, it was Google mm -hmm. Video. And I was at first totally vilified, like, holy shit, who's this guy who's turning the industry inside out? Ultimately, it came around for me, but right. how has it been for well, you? You know the mushroom theory of power? No. It's, See? I'm just, this is like school. <laughs> it's a keep them in the dark and feed them shit. Okay. <laughs> and Brilliant. So, I get it now. <laughs> so, you know, the, the powers that be are very uncomfortable when, yeah. you, you know, when you shed light on something, when you reveal the truth because... They, they lose their power, you know, so um, that's what you've done. You've empowered people. You've given them the tools to empower themselves or to have their autonomy. And, and I think that's the real American dream. The American dream isn't just letting celebrities live the American dream and we just strive for it. The, the, the real American dream is where we're all empowered and we can all have the tools to pave our own way and... Um, and I think that's one thing that the internet has done, is give, given us all an opportunity to see the truth, have the power to connect with one another, collaborate, and you know, forge our own destiny. You mentioned creativity several times. That's what Creative Live is about. That's what the show's about. Um, and there's this simultaneous, there's the, the, the nugget of what called creativity, which is making things. But then there's all these sort of vehicles and tools that are now sort of upon us that weren't, weren't around just even five years ago. Can you talk about that landscape and about creativity in general for me for a little bit? Like how you, I mean, I know it's, it's, I don't want to be too vague, but like, how do you look at that? Are, are these business, like, do you create these businesses because now that you have an opportunity and there's no gatekeepers, like how do you look at the whole ecosystem of this sort of new level of creativity that we have access to? Yeah, well, from the old model of control and you know, sort of the power structure that would give a certain few select people, you know, the key to, to have success. And, you know, back in the day when actors, you know, there were very few actors that, that became famous and the studio, the, the, the studio machine would, would control them essentially. And, and it was this sort of separate thing where they were somehow imbued with holiness and, they, and that's yeah. why they became yeah. famous. That's why they were revered. That's why they were stars. And that's not true. They were selected by the, you know, the studios and they were cultivated and built. And because the studios had the outlets, because the studios controlled the distribution system, they could make anybody famous. In walks the internet, 
throws that all out the window because now anybody has access. And now you look on, online and people have made themselves famous and, and have, have, have taken um, charge for their, their own careers. And that's more competition, not only for the studios, but the, the Humphrey Bogarts of, us, of the world. Yeah. So now we're all competing on the same playing field. And this is the same, the same is true for, for me. You know, I, um, you know, you asked, did I, even get, did I get any shit from the industry when I was making Teenage Paparazzo? And the answer is yes, because I, my colleagues would pull me aside. They'd be like, dude, what are you doing? You're blowing our program dude, here. Dude, we, we have it good. We have a good thing here. Uh, you know, let's like, hold on <laughs> to it. And, and I don't see it that way. I, I think the, you know, the internet, we're in the information age, and that's a good thing. And we are more empowered as a people, as a society, and I, th I think that's a good thing. And I want to cultivate that and, and give support to, uh, to that as opposed to trying to, you know, be part of this mushroom theory. Sure. And so I embrace the competition and I look to make more community, more collaboration. And that way, that, you know, when, when you've made it in, in the old system, it's very insecure because one little mistake and you fall from grace and you lose everything and now you're, you're back with the, you know, the, the peons, right? Yeah. But in, in, in the other model where we're all working together collaboratively, we all have a piece of the pie and we're all helping each other out and you're a lot happier you know, you're not as insecure, and it's just, I think, a better model. Well, let's, let's go one level deeper there. So you mentioned earlier, like, people striving for, we'll call it celebrity, or let's just gen more generally call it success, where your peers know your name because you've, you've sort of made it, in, whether you're making it in, you know, in uh, hair and makeup or in design or acting or making films or whatever. If, if the goal, and, you know, you've just said, pretty unequivocally that, hey, when you get there and you get to the top of the mountain, there's fuck all up there. It's empty. And the, really the journey is, you know, the, is the thing. So for the folks at home that are just starting out on their journey, how do you give them, you give, give the folks at home a sense of like purpose without at the end of the, it's not really celebrity. There's no bell you ring. There's no, how, how do you juxtapose or how do you sort of navigate those two things? Yeah. And, and not to say that you shouldn't strive for success or you shouldn't strive to grow your audience or you shouldn't strive to share with more people your work. I don't think that that's necessarily a bad thing, but not to forget why you're doing it. Why are you sharing it with more people? Why are you building your audience? Uh, and it's not just for the sake of it. For it's sure. not just to have more adoration or more attention. Uh, it's it's for what, what's, I mean, I can't tell you what your purpose is. I can't, you know, yeah. that's got to come from you. Your uh, purpose has got to come from you. I think that's critical. Yeah, so, uh, I mean, I could tell you what my purpose is. That's, what I, that's my next question. Oh. <laughs> so what, what, is, what is your purpose? Like, you've, you've done so many different things in different industries. How do you, how do you view, like, do you have a mission statement, or what, what are you living by these days? Okay, so I'm a college dropout. And when I was in my early 20s, I recognized that I was not making the most of my college years because <laughs> I still hadn't gotten the partying down yet. So I was still trying to perfect that. And, um, and, I, and I, you know, I was spending money on college and I instinctively realized that I was going to just be in debt that I didn't really want and, and that ultimately I wasn't learning enough because I wasn't you know, really maximizing my time there. So I dropped out. I took the hard road round and uh, and since then, and, and really dropping out, I realized that if I'm not going to learn in school, I need to learn on my own. So that's when I started to read a lot of books and apply myself personally to just make sure that I was keeping my brain exercised. And so I, I guess my purpose in life is just to always learn because I never quite finished college. And I just want to make sure that I'm always I, you know, and I, and I think that institutional education is f fine and dandy and, and great in its own way, but the, the, the thing that it does that I don't like is it limits or it reduces learning to the institution or to the four walls. And I really think that we need to recognize that learning is a lifelong goal, a lifelong experience, and even after you leave school, you still got to be learning. So I guess my purpose, my goal is to always be learning and 
evolving my brain. Now, we just finished sort of uh, attacking Hollywood a little bit, but now I want to like go into it a little, because I feel I'll like- never there's... work again. Don't air this, please, <laughs> man. Give All right, yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're about to ruin Adrian Grenier's career, so stay Nobody tuned. in Hollywood watches your show. Of Come course, on, let's I know, it. I know, except the last ones that have uh, <laughs> sent me letters asking me to make a show for him. Um, that being said, there is, uh, I think there's still a little bit of a black box around, around Hollywood. How do you get into it? What do you do? What's it like when you get there? And rather than like talk generally about it, let's talk about your specific experience. So I don't know if people, like you, you came out of nowhere for me. I mean, I know you had Double Wars Prada, you had all these little things, all these like great little pop-up cameos and this and that, and then all of a sudden you had your own show. What was that like? Was it good, bad, ugly? Was it incredible? You're like, I've made it. I'm not the right guy to give advice about how to make it in Hollywood. Why not? Because I just got lucky. Like, I, I could give you advice on how not to do it and how to be, uh, you know, an ungrateful, rebellious prick, <laughs> but I can't tell you how to play the game right, because I've always just been uh, doing things my own way, for better, for worse. I got lucky a couple times, and that really saved me from myself. <laughs> the truth is, I was in Mexico trying to make a documentary. I was trying to sneak into Cuba. This was many yeah, years yeah, ago many, before yeah. you can just go there. Yeah. Um, trying to sneak into Cuba to make a documentary about Cuban hip hop. And I got a call and I'm like, there's this show Entourage, you should come audition for it, you're perfect. And I was like, nah, I'm busy. So were you modeling at the time? Because modeling. I mean, no one calls, no one just says, Matt, have you ever gotten a call from Hollywood saying, Matt, there's this awesome show that's coming up? No, you haven't. So he's shaking the camera, no. So you had to be in the world of... Well, yeah, because the... ever, ever since I was in junior high school, because I wasn't particularly sporty, mm -hmm. because I was a mama's boy, because I grew up you know, with a single mom, only child, I didn't do so well in the sports area. Yeah, you're coming around there, you're getting out Thank and you're you. skiing, snowboarding. So well, no, I mean, I'm, I have natural athleticism, That's but what, it wasn't yes. cultivated by a father figure, you see? I, I so, do, I get it. Um, but at the time, I didn't, do, you know, I didn't do so well in the sports, so I ended up doing a lot of theater, which I quite enjoyed, and, um, and so I did, I, you know, I had agents who were constantly seeking me out to, put, you know, put me on auditions and such. Sure. So and that's, that's a little backstory. So you I, were a part of the machine and... Well, I was being invited into it. Got it. And then I would always, you know, skip auditions or, you know, do something to mess up the audition. And whether it was subconscious or just rebellion, I don't know. But eventually, uh, you know, I, I, I got this opportunity to audition for Entourage. So you're in Mexico, you get a phone I was call. In Mexico, yeah, and I resisted and then I... Um, I finally, I finally saw a reason, and I was like, eventually this machine will turn its back on me, and I won't have these opportunities anymore. And by the way, I had maybe you know thousand dollars to my name, which I was planning on spending all on on the documentary and then figuring it out later. Um, but instead, I I got a strong talking to by my manager, who said, you you, you got to do this, and if you don't, I'm out. find another manager. And so I, I went, I auditioned, and I really, I just got lucky, man. I got the part, like, I don't know. I could have easily, it could have easily not worked that way. But was there a, was it written that it was a guy from Queens that went to LA? Or when they found you, did they write, there's this guy from Queens who? Well, no, it, the, they, uh, Doug Allen, yeah. who created the show, was very deliberate about hiring authentic New Yorkers. Or people from the East Coast. Yeah. Excuse me. That was gross. <laughs> um, how good are your, is your sound equipment? <laughs> uh, yeah, so, so, you know, because I was from the East Coast, that helped. But I think it also helped the rapport amongst the guys. Yeah. We had that New York you swagger, the, thing, yeah. the vibe. And so we got each other. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it was just... And I think that's the, the reality with a lot of acting work. Eventually, you, it starts to become strategic where you're leveraging power or leveraging your celebrity or your fame or your popularity to get other parts. Like you can in build. the show. Like there's a meta thing going Absolutely. on with the show, right? I mean, uh, yeah. 
You know, it, there's a reason why you see the same big actors in all the movies because they're building an audience, they're building an awareness factor, and they help get movies made because the people making movies want people to go pay for tickets and go in the theater. So there's a business aspect to it. But in a lot of ways, you know, if all things are equal and there's no favoritism and there are two people auditioning for the same role, they could both be great and maybe have different interpretations, but eventually a decision has to be made. And a casting director or a director or a producer is going to make a decision potentially on arbitrary, for arbitrary reasons. Or maybe it is like, hey, you know, this person has more Instagram followers, so we're just going to go with that guy. Um, that's crazy, right? I think the same is true for photography, and my, my experience is the same. Like you start, as soon as you started telling stories about making the behind-the-scenes thing, and it was like, oh, wow, this person, it, they could reach as many people as the campaign can. That's a really interesting thing. But yeah. like, you're here to acknowledge that. Yeah, and I, I guess I'm not, I'm not giving any real like insight. It's just, it's natural, right? Sure. But a lot of, I think a lot of people get frustrated that they aren't given the shot or they don't get the part and they somehow take it personally. Don't take it personally. You know, you, and that's why I say when people ask me, oh, how do I make it in the music, movie industry? I say, well, you, you got a camera. At least you have a smartphone. So you have a, access to a camera. You have yourself. You're the vehicle. So go out and make something. Go out and do it. Step one, make something. Yeah. Step two, repeat step one. Right. Do you feel like, did you make enough stuff to get noticed? Is that like, were, were you in the limelight enough to be able to get noticed? Because you sort of just presented something that was a little bit different than that. And I'm trying to, did you take your own advice or does it, do you go back to like, I was lucky, I didn't, wasn't making a lot, but I just happened to land this part? Well, I, I would have always been satisfied making documentaries. So I had that going for me. Yeah. Do you want to wait for this plane? No, I like the plane. How does this work? The plane is okay. nice. Okay. We're, we're going for there it. There are planes in life. There are planes. And burps. Planes and burps. <laughs> That's the title of the episode. Uh, planes and burps. Um, you know, I, I guess I was just, I've been lucky enough to find satisfaction, contentment with not a lot, you know. So um, I would have been happy just making documentaries. So you get a call from Mexico, you get on the show. Most people don't know what it's like to, to go be on a show. The show, basically, if it sucks, like four weeks in, they're like, you're done. Thank you very much. Go, everyone go home. But your show didn't suck. It didn't suck. It didn't <laughs> suck. It had traction. Was it the chemistry? Was it Doug? Was it the concept? It was, I mean, it was all of that. Um, it has to be, right, in order yeah. to sort of make it. Yeah, it, it was a synergy of a lot of different things, but it was in the zeitgeist. You know, people were curious about this whole celebrity thing. Um, and then you had the, the core essence, the emotional essence of the show, which was brotherhood and companionship, and that was nice to see. And then you had some, you know, pretty things to look at. You know, the cars, all the materialism that we're so fascinated with in our capitalist culture. So, I mean, it was... It was a pretty recipedic approach to creating a show. A hundred percent. And... And it was well written. Yeah, for sure. The dialogue, unbelievable. Mm -hmm. How much of the dialogue is yours versus Doug's? Well, and or the writers. No, I mean that's the thing. Is a lot of people feel that the show is improvised or that it's, you know, that it's a reality show. Yeah. <laughs> but it was scripted. A hundred percent of it was scripted. Very few lines were improvised, and so it was both the, the writing that felt authentic and real and off the cuff, and then the acting, which somehow we were able to just you know, lock in and click in, in that r rapport so that we could make it feel real. How was it And then it was sh the way it was shot as well, yeah, hand yeah. handheld. Oh, for sure, really, you know. like, yeah, I loved it. Mm -hmm. um, how is it playing someone who, no disrespect here, you've said this to me, it was weird playing someone who was way more famous than I am. <laughs> is that interesting and weird and cool or is it messed up? I mean, you like because you literally played like the George Clooney of. I'm happy. Ish. I'm happy for Vince and his career, and where, where what he's reached, what he's managed to do, uh, in his career. And as I said, I'm happy with where I'm at. You yeah. Know? So, um, I'm not mad at him. <laughs> no, not hating on Vinny, you know, of course. 
Um, no, it's no what, there, there, I don't remember who said it. There's a quote. Maybe your audience can help me find out. Maybe it's a quote I invented, I'd like to think. <laughs> Uh, and, and I'm going to bastardize the sure. quote, my own quote, but it's something about you know a writer, like a, a character in a book can only be as smart as the author. Aha! Uh -huh. Right, because the author is the, reaches yep. a ceiling yep. of intelligence, and he can't write a character any smarter than that. So when you have really highly intelligent characters in books, you know that the author is pretty damn smart. You get where I'm going with this? I do, I do. I get it. All right. <laughs> um, so let's talk before we go into what I think we're both very, very excited to talk about. And your beaming smile over there. Yes, you have a beaming smile. Just, oh, this is going to, we're going to tear the roof off. Um, let's talk a little bit about you personally, because I think a, a lot of folks at home are like, what can I do today? And you've already said make stuff. You got a morning routine? Like, is there some, like, what are some of the things that you feel like contribute to your day-to-day -day happiness, day-to-day -day success as a creative? Uh, I'm trying to think of a positive thing to say about my morning routine, but I... A nighttime routine. Do you have I, any... I'm, I'm ashamed to say that I, I go straight from my phone. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's, like, generally shunned upon these days. Uh, but I do, I'm excited. You know what it is? I'm just really excited and motivated to get to work. So I, I, I don't know. Um, but I do exercise. Take care of yourself. I do, yes, absolutely have to do that. Um, How about do you have a creative, uh, is there something that you do every day to be creative? Like is that a requirement? Like before you go to bed, you've got to like journal, um, you know, write a scene, play a riff. How, yeah. how, how much of a part of your daily routine is making something? My, see, my, I don't have a routine. And that's the truth. That's, all, I, that's, that's what we want to know. We want the truth. I, I travel a lot and things are always changing. I have several different projects with different people sort of working them. So, you know, I just, I just have this sort of flow where I, 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 don't, I don't sweat any one detail, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, and for me, it's just a matter of just patience, having patience, and knowing the things will have their life and they'll evolve or they'll de-evolve yeah. often. Um, and just to, it's a sort of a Zen thing for me, just to let things have their incubation time, their period, and not to sweat the small stuff. So there's this uh, a friend of mine named Brene Brown. I don't know if you know who work, her work. She's a, a researcher. She talks a lot about vulnerability. She's like Oprah Powell, a really inspirational woman. Um, she talks a lot about gold-plated gold -plated grit, where uh, it's, it's, it's so in, to, in vogue to be vulnerable, like, oh, yeah, I had this hardship. And then I was right back on top. So is there some things that you could tell me or the folks at home or both of us that yeah, man, I've, had, I've been in some shit. It's been really hard. There was a time where I was broke and tired. And um, can you talk about that in a, in a really, in a way that is something that people wouldn't have thought possible? Well, I, quite honestly and vulnerably, I don't feel like I've succeeded in anything ever. <laughs> wow. How's that? Yeah, no, that's, it's, 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 but it's real. And, and I think that... I have a friend whose company is worth billions of dollars, and he talks about having more fear and sort of bad gremlin voices in his head now than ever before when he had, you know, when he was a month from insolvency in the same startup. So it's, yeah. it's, I think that's a, it's a very real thing to say. Well, connected to what I said earlier about wanting to always strive and, you know, learn, and, you know, that learning experience is constant and forever. It's the same with creativity or entrepreneurship where you're just somewhere on the learning curve. You're just, you're, but you're still on the learning curve. And if you ever reach the top of the learning curve, you're probably going to get bored and do something else. Yeah. So I haven't been successful in any project I've done, in any business I've started, because uh, I'm still on that curve. And that's not a bad thing. Like, I don't need success. I just need to constantly be evolving towards, you know, 
Is it the work? Next. Then you feel good about the work. Is like, is that the buzz that you get? Because if you haven't achieved success, you're still waking up and putting in the hours. Is it the act of making? Is it the act of building that you really are drawn to? I mean, absolutely, yes. And knowing that your contribution is what you know helps the the collective, right? Mm -hmm. You're giving of yourself to the world, and it's supporting you back. Um, and so I'm just, you know, being of service, doing my part, waking up humbly and, you know, just pushing the cogs. What a guy. <laughs> what a guy, right? What a guy. All right. I'm, uh, I, I want to shift gears now. Is there anything you want to say about, about uh, the work that you're doing these days before we start talking about the lonely whale? Because I know we covered a lot of ground. Maybe I'm going to say one other thing. Talk about um, how to make money selling drugs. Hmm. Okay, well, first you buy some drugs, okay. and then you sell it for more, more money, money than, than you bought it for. And then you repeat. And you make money. Great. Oh, no, you mean the documentary. The documentary called How to Make Money oh, okay. Selling yeah, Drugs. I got confused for a second. Yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, so uh, I, I produced a documentary called How to Make Money Selling Drugs, and it was, yes, partly about the industry of making money selling drugs, but it was also about the... Um, sort of the, I totally got distracted for a second. Um, <laughs> that, that plane that flew over? <laughs> no, so it, it's, it's also about the failed war on drugs and how um, our laws are, are, are designed, or they're built to try and protect us from drugs themselves and make us fearful of them and help protect us from the criminals who sell drugs uh, but ultimately have failed us because they, they're worse than the, the drugs themselves. They're worse than the criminals because they impoverish us and they imprison us, imprison us. disproportionately amongst right. black and males under the age of 30. And they do nothing to actually solve the medical problem, which is addiction. They do nothing to prevent drug use. Mm -hmm. So we just have to think of a new way to address people and, and, and why it is that they turn to drugs in an unhealthy way in the first place. I loved the film. I thought it was great, playful, all the sort of on-screen animations. Branson has been a part of this, he's been on this show, part of this 30 Days of Genius series, and he's just, I don't know if you've noticed lately, but he's super outspoken. He was at the, we filmed in, with him just recently in New York, and he was going <laughs> to the UN the next day to put it, like basically to go all in on how effed up our view on drugs is. Well, it's gaining momentum, thankfully. Yeah, when, we're in you know, Washington where we are right now. Weed is legal. Well, you know, it's about time. For you sure. Know, I certainly <laughs> personally advocate for decriminalization, if not legalization entirely, uh, but certainly an alternative to uh, prohibition. Mm -hmm. um, and it's becoming less and less taboo because I think people have the information now and people are, are recognizing that it, the drugs aren't the problem, it's the policies. Yeah. And it's, we need to invest less in SWAT teams and uh, imprisonment and more in education and inspiration because people who have uh, goals in life, people who have opportunities, they don't do drugs. Yeah. Because they're too busy building their dreams instead of smoking to find their dreams in a, another way. Um, I just, I just I don't, we probably should get on to the main event here, but um, it, I loved the film. I thought it was interesting. I was happy to promote it. Our, our views are aligned there entirely. Do um, you see yourself producing a lot more films? Well, it's funny you should say that because it's a great segue. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, again, I'm always learning. Like when, After each documentary I make, I become a virtual expert, not an expert, but I know a lot more than I did. And it's a way for me to explore subject and to understand it better. And, and, um, and so after How to Make Money Selling Drugs, I started talking to a friend of mine about this documentary called 52, The Search for the Loneliest Whale in the World. And my friend Lucy, who was producing it, invited me on to help her produce that film. And I said, I would love to, under one condition, you let me build out a larger platform around the film. Because one thing that I'd learned over the years is if you want to, you know, in order to be more autonomous and independent as a documentary filmmaker, you really have to act like a studio in a lot of ways. And you have to start doing all the things that a studio would do and building all these ancillary 
products and content and merchandise. And with this film about a particular whale, I thought we had a great opportunity, and here's why. The whale, his name is 52, and he is known as the loneliest whale in the world because he was discovered back during the Cold War by the US Navy to speak a different frequency than other whales. So he's been calling out his whole life without receiving a response. And knowing that whales are sentient and highly social, just like humans, we can only imagine that he'd be a little bummed out and lonely. Nobody else out there. Nobody else. Returning my calls I've been calling. And whales live to 100 plus years old. They, they do. They do. And he's floating out there in the abyss of emptiness of the ocean, the vastness, without any companionship. And they're, they're certain that they've, they've tracked this whale, that he's the only whale, or she is the only whale. Is it he? Do they know that? He's a he. Yeah. Only males sing. Ah. Yeah. Uh, one of the things you learned about making a documentary about whales. That's one of the things, yes. <laughs> yes, and I'm still learning. Yes. But so uh, what I did was um, I started to build out all these other sort of ancillary verticals, these other touch points to the ocean through this symbolic hero character, the lonely whale. And one of the, and also wanting to have a call to action. So, not just making the film to tell the story of the lonely whale, um, but also at the end of the film, being able to direct your energy when you do feel empathy and compassion for the whale, uh, and 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 his plight, which is the plight of all. Yeah, there's a great connection between the sort of loneliness and lack of connection that we all feel despite being more connected. Where's my phone anyway? <laughs> <laughs> more connected than ever before, but to be, in a sense, lonely. It's, it's a beautiful uh, narrative for sure. Yeah, I'm, and this all ties into everything we've been talking about. Yep. You know, community building and connecting with others to solve the world's problems. And, and, and also it's our disconnect and our ignorance that really has created a lot of the environmental issues. You know, if, if, if we felt what, what, what the whale was going through, if it wasn't so far and vast and out of touch, out of mind, but if we were really connected to the fact that that whale's our, our you know, that's our, our brother. Our brother, yeah. Our, our, I mean, and he, he's out there swimming with all the plastic yeah, garbage and, and, in the ocean. And by the way, those are our oceans. Yeah. You know, so the, we are on parallel paths with the planet. And the wants and needs of marine wildlife and the whale are our own. We want connection, we want companionship, we want a, a healthy, clean environment. Mm -hmm. We want a clean room, you know. Yep. And so this whale has really given us an opportunity to start to communicate these ideas on a level that people understand. So just like how to make money selling drugs, we spoke the language of the people. It was plain language, it was pop language. We didn't, you know, it wasn't like a lot, a lot of talking heads. We had fun with it, you know, we wanted yeah. to talk the way people talk, you know, no, no, nothing was, uh, you know, censored or omitted, and and it wasn't this sort of didactic, you know, in, intellectualized documentary. It was just like a, a cool film, and so we're doing the same thing with with the oceans and with this whale. We have an opportunity to dip into and connect on a very plain human level. So and one of the ancillary things then that you're building out around this particular character? It is the foundation, the Lonely Well Foundation, which is really designed to connect people and then bond them with the oceans, give them an opportunity to, to connect with the whale and the, the oceans in general so that they have that empathetic relationship so that they can make better choices uh, for the oceans. And, Sweet. And are we ready? And we're ready. The best smile in show business. <laughs> yeah, and so I, I, the re one of the yes, reasons why please. I'm here in Seattle yes. uh -huh. is to visit the, the fantastic, wonderful, great Dune Ives, who we've recently just brought in to lead, lead the charge at the Lonely Well Foundation, and, and she's our executive director. <laughs> why is she over there shaking her head? Come, come on out here. <laughs> come on, come on. She, she's, uh, yeah. Here, hug it out, hug it out. I'm gonna just across the table here. Good, nice Hi. to see you. <laughs> it's good to see you. You're a great part of the Seattle community. <laughs> uh, yeah, um, so I came, I came up to see Dune because we've recently just started working together. And so we have a lot of, a lot of things to do to sort of hand over this project and also 
you know, really start to define our goals. And I mean, I'm a media guy. I, I tell good stories, perhaps. But one thing that I, I really needed is somebody who's been there, who's had the experience, who knows about philanthropy and knows um, and has the relationships to really build that coalition so that we can do you know, effective work. And so, and walk, do knives. Ba boom. <laughs> so you get the stage. We, I'm super. <laughs> so you've been a part of the Seattle community for a long time. Actually, we have a mutual friend, Megan, who's maybe someone. Is Megan? I know she's coming here. Let's make sure she's not locked out somewhere. Um, but so, uh, how how in the hell did a you guys get connected? I mean, no, you separately from you, but mm -hmm. now you guys are sitting here in. The, I love it. Fate. Fate. Fate it connected fate. you. <laughs> but, but like, what attracted you to the project? So I, I left my last gig in January and, and wanted to take some time to really see what it is I wanted to do and who was out there that I was really compelled to work with. We have a mutual friend in New York, and we were talking one day, and she said, oh, you've got to meet Adrian. And I think she actually said it like, like, you've got to meet Adrian. Yeah, everyone does. And I said, okay, who's Adrian? <laughs> who's this guy? And, and she talked about, he just started this, this lovely little foundation and, and really wants to do big things. So meet him, see what you think. And, and the first moment that I spoke with Adrian, actually the first email I got from him, I'm like, oh, this is a different kind of guy. He's really, really, really nice, really grounded, nice, really informed, yeah. really grounded. And then when we first spoke over Skype, just really connected with him on a, I think, a really deep personal level that here's this guy who lives and breathes everything that you just heard in the interview. Yeah. I mean, truly to the core of who he is, he's compassionate, he's real. Well, he's just pretending he's not here. <laughs> right? Oh, no, I I'm said that earlier, didn't I? I already admitted <laughs> compassion. that. I'm compassionate, I'm so real. So just real. compassionate. No, and, so true. And really, and, you know, everything he said about his house in Brooklyn, you know, I showed up there. I think I rolled in around two o'clock in the morning. Adrian comes in. He's like, "Hey, let me show you my house. Let me show you my house. Let me show you the rec room." So I, I immediately felt like this is this is somebody that I can absolutely go to the end of, of the earth with. We have a lot of work to do on behalf of 52 and to improve ocean health as quickly as we possibly can. And so that really matters a lot to me. It's hard to turn away from the narrative of 52, isn't it's, it? It's a. You hear I the mean, story. Like, seriously, this I don't remember when you laid it on me, but I was like, this first like, time it's I heard so, it. So like the heartstrings are like they're just yeah. so real. And actually, a mutual friend, I remember telling Megan about it. She just walked in the room here, and she was like, she loves whales. She was like, how 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 can I be involved? This is it's such a yeah. compelling narrative. Well, we've it had is. several conversations about it too. Many and. I think now through Dune, we can finally work together yeah. Yeah. because she knows how to put the pieces together. I get it. Yeah. I'm here. You know, we said earlier that Creative Live can be a, a power for good, and if you mm -hmm. guys need a platform mm -hmm. for global broadcasting, we're happy to provide it, whether we're raising money or awareness or whatever. Mm -hmm. it, it, mikasa Sukasa. What, like, you, you've been, you get the keys to the kingdom now. He's like, all right. Where are we going? <laughs> so what, he keep, yeah, he keeps trying to hand him to me, and I keep saying no, not not quite, <laughs> not yet. quite yet, not but, quite yet. But I mean, there's a, a whole bunch of creativity behind it. Obviously, making mm -hmm. films, and you've got art installations. You got what's Music. in store for this, and how could people get involved? You know, we're really starting first with a K through six curriculum, really providing kids and teachers with tools on how to connect not just with the ocean and with 52, but quite honestly, how do you connect with scientists? So we've got yeah. a great partnership with Oceana, a wonderful organization in this space, and they're lending us their scientists so the kids can connect with them and really understand why are they on the boat for weeks on end? What are they doing out there searching for what and what are they finding? Really compelling, and we're gonna be building that out over the course of the rest of this year and into 2017. So outside of that, what you're going to see from the Lonely Well Foundation are some very creative partnerships. You mentioned okay. Branson earlier. Yep. Very connected to his team. Hopefully, shortly after this airs, you're going to see a big announcement come out with Adrian and Branson. Oh, great. About a global ocean health challenge. Were you with them in New York last week? Haha, <laughs> 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 it's going to uh -huh. be really exciting. Sweet. Uh -huh. We'll Sweet. follow up in the fall yeah, with that. Yeah, he's a huge. I also want to connect you guys <laughs> with 
a guy named Mike Horn, which is the world's sort of foremost explorer. I think we've talked about mm -hmm. Mike before. He's yeah. sailed around the world seven times. He circumnavigated the Arctic Circle, first guy to solo to the North Pole in winter, yeah. swam the Amazon, like just Sounds crazy like shit. And he, yeah, and he's like, I'm gonna personally go out there and grab that big pile of plastic and tow it to the, <laughs> you know I mean? He's like, he's a crazy guy. So we'll, we'll connect him. But so Good. there's it's partnerships, that's one of the ways. Yeah. How, about, how about at an individual contributor level? What are, what are the ways that the folks at home who are watching this? Mm -hmm. I think. There's, just to, to put a pause on that for a second, the folks at home, A, they want to learn from you guys about what it's like to live this life. There's actionable sort of insights that you've talked about with mentorship, but there's also a desire to get involved. You've mentioned community so many times. So let's give the folks at home an opportunity to plug into something. How would you recommend they take action? I think the first thing that everybody should do is to friend the lonely well. Okay. Go to Team Lonely Well, go to any of our social handles, and become part of our community because we have a lot to learn from everybody else. What they do, what they're passionate about, how they're taking action, and we're committed to sharing that across all of our channels and through all of our partners so that their story becomes inspirational for others. That's a huge part of what we want to do in building this global community of ocean health advocates and quite honestly, the virtual pod for the Lonely Well. Nice. He needs one. Well, that's maybe why you're up in Seattle too. We got we got whales galore. We do. Yeah, we got them. We have whales galore. We have whales that have a lot of environmental issues For associated sure. with them. And so, you know, through the lens of the lonely whale, and by developing this global connected audience and learning from them and being inspired by them, we really feel strongly that that this is the missing piece. All these organizations that have been fighting the good fight for a very long time, and yet our our oceans are still degrading. And I think honestly, it's because we as a global citizenry haven't stepped up yet. Yeah. We don't we haven't found a way to connect with the ocean. Every time you look at it, it looks fine, doesn't it? it does it's look blue nice or blue, blue green or kind of gray. It's, it's always pretty, moving. Yeah. It's hard to understand how we're impacting it negatively. So we ask people to share the story. There are very simple things that you can do. You can say no to straws. Say you no can, to straws. You can say no to straws. You can say no to plastic bottles. You can say yes to sustainable seafood very simple things you can do every single day. But we want to curate that, and we want to share it broadly, and we want to engage people, so you're going to see a lot of activations come from us. Mm -hmm. and, and, and one thing that I've always understood is there's no panacea, there's no one solution. Uh, there are as many solutions as there are humans on the planet, and we all have to participate. We all have to do our part and, and, and bring ourselves to the, to the solution. And, um, I've, I've always been rebellious, as I've mentioned before, so I never liked when people gave me a prescriptive list of things to do. And, and also, w when people do that, they do it and then they check out. This is about changing your perspective, uh, folding it into your lifestyle so that it's in your heart, it's in your mind every day, all the time. Not just like, okay, I did that and I'm done. I gave 20 bucks mm -hmm. and now I'm done. No, no, it's, it's, right. it's we're, we're building, we're giving, a, a, a whale who had no friends, a, a global community of friends. And then every day we're going to support him in his everyday plight. So folks can go up to lonelywell.org. They can sign up. They can stay connected with us. They can teach us. And Good. we can celebrate. So you've got You've already done a bunch of activations too. You've done mm -hmm. some art shows. You've got the, the, the film. What, what are some things that people can go <coughs> see for a little bit of like, ah, more context? Because this, the, I love the narrative. I think it's a, such a powerful narrative. Mm -hmm. um, and I would love to sort of connect the narrative with some things that you've already done so that it'll help people understand where all this is going. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the, the education program is in development with our partners in Chicago at the Academy for Global Citizenship. It's a charter school, amazing, uh, and their their uh, their mascot is a whale, so it's perfect. <laughs> perfect. Because did you know th did you know that whales are global citizens, just like humans? They're the only, well, besides maybe birds, the only other species that can travel the entire globe, and they do through the seas that connect uh -huh. the entire planet. Uh, and they can also communicate around the world. So they have a very sophistic, sophisticated system of communicating where they can actually call out uh, underwater and through the trenches. And it, because of the temperature and the depth and the density of the water, their frequency will travel the entire globe and they can relay messages to each other around the world. 
Wow. So Even if you don't speak the language, you can like pass it on for Freddie. Absolutely. Yeah, wow. it's like it, it's it's extremely sophisticated, and a lot of it we don't we still don't understand. But um, they're a lot like us, a lot like us. Anyway, I, I, I digress. So we have the education program that we're building. Uh, we we built, and then the, of course the film that's in development, um, and we have a virtual reality experience that was made possible by Dell. Yeah, talk, let's uh, talk mm -hmm. about that for a second. Actually. Yeah, it's interesting. VR is, uh, you know, I was. Were you at South by? We, yeah. yeah, we must mm -hmm. have missed each other. Uh, South by VR. It was just VR or Snapchat. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like those are the two Everywhere. things. That people, but what kind of VR experiment are you or experience are you guys designing? Yeah, so I, I've been Dell's social good advocate for the past year, and we've just renewed our agreement, and I'm going to continue for the next year. And we're doing actually a couple of things with them uh, around Lonely Whale. But the first thing we did was build the virtual reality experience, and it gives people an opportunity who can't necessarily go out and dive with whales or. Uh, people who are landlocked, living in uh, the, the middle of the country, have an opportunity to see what it's like out in the middle of the ocean swimming with the whale. And you get a brief introduction to some of the things that whales face every day, like ocean noise pollution, which a lot of people don't know is becoming an increasing problem, amongst other things, plastics pollution and acidification. But ocean noise pollution is doubling every decade, and it's man-made because of increased shipping traffic and military ex experiments and, uh, and of course, oil exploration. Yeah. We're creating this cacophony of noise, which is actually disrupting the communication systems of whales. And one of the reasons why scientists think our particular whale, the lonely whale, 52, is speaking at a different frequency, because he's trying to call above or, or below that ocean noise. Um, and so this virtual reality experience is not just VR, it's not just immersive visually, but it's also, we, we use this theater seating, which gives you a 4D mm -hmm. experience, it spritzes you, you can feel <laughs> the, the yeah. fish swimming around your body. Actual fish? Yeah, they have really, little... Yeah, you really feel it. They have little uh, sensors that push and prod and poke you uh, while you're going through it, so it's a fully dynamic immersive experience. Mm -hmm. Wow. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that's the thing. Mm -hmm. There's yeah. the, the, the Dell activation, the film, which is in development, you mm -hmm. mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, and also, Dell um, has agreed, uh, be, because of Lonely Whale, and because we have a, a sort of a, a mutual exchange where I'm helping them achieve their uh, legacy of good goals by 2020, trying to be uh, a net positive uh, co corporation uh, and good corporate citizens. I'm, at, I'm helping them achieve those goals. They're also helping me achieve the goals for the Lonely Whale Foundation, one of which is figuring out how to include ocean-bound plastic and upcycle it into their um, products so oh, that we can include, you know, plastics that's bound yeah. for the ocean uh, in their product stream. Fascinating. Mm -hmm. So is there some, let's pretend he's not here for a second. <laughs> Are there some things that, as you're setting out to sort of take the reins of this foundation, are there some things beyond what Adrian was just talking about that you would want people to know? Like, what's a takeaway? Uh, we've already talked about where to send them, lonelywhale.org. Uh, there's all the social handles that you, challenge, that you mentioned. Is there anything that is like, what's, you know, where do you see this thing going? Is it, is it, uh, are we just gonna spend all of our time and energy fixing the ocean, which is a lifelong, mission, I'm mm -hmm. sure, or how wide do you see this going? You're already talking about films and advocacy and recycling plastics, and I really don't see an end to this. Like, mm -hmm. what, mm -hmm. what's possible? <laughs> what's, the, what's, the, what's the outer edges of what you're building? Great question. I don't know that there are necessarily outer edges that we're thinking about right now. You know, our, we know that we need to galvanize a, a mass of people around the world. It's not just in the United States, but mm -hmm. all over the world. And how do you do that best? Through art, through film, through music, which we haven't talked about, which maybe that's the next yep. episode that we can talk through. Uh -huh. um, and through education, all towards creating empathy, not just for the ocean, but for each other. And, and that's, I think, one of the reasons why I was so compelled to join Adrian and the Foundation. So many environmental organizations are focused on the animals and they're focused on the direct action and it's so important to do and the policy change. 
And yet still at the end of the day, you can walk away from those experiences and not talk to your neighbor, help your neighbor out. Yeah. Right, and not, not look across the street and wonder how that family is really overcoming the tragedy they just had in their life. And that really is what it all comes down to, right? Is yeah. If we care deeply about each other, then we will care deeply about the ocean. We will care deeply about these marine animals. And so how do we, how do, we do that through the lens of the lonely whale well, yeah. in addition to saving the ocean, well, it's such which a, it's, we need to do? Yeah, it's a, such a, com and this is one of the reasons I was very excited to talk about this particular, you know, we wanted to spend part of the program talking about the, you know, lifelong learning and a lot of the things you already articulated, but that's of all of the things that you could be involved in, you're watching this show because you're passionate about creativity and entrepreneurship and taking action, doing something instead of doing nothing. And here is this incredible, you know, you know the power of storying, this incredible narrative, and to be able to plug in via film, via music, mm -hmm. via community. These are all things that are core values for us at Creative Live and I know core values for you or you wouldn't be watching this show. So the hope is that this is like a one-to-one -one, like, oh, I want to get, I love the mission and the vision and now through all these different things, through the film, through community gathering, through um, uh, innovation, entrepreneurship, we haven't talked about music. We're gonna we're gonna have a separate meeting after this. I can't wait. You should come down and sit in this chair right here. Just make yourself more comfortable. You're standing back there. We're gonna have a little meeting after this show. But like, how does uh, how do you activate around music? Because I'm a music freak. And I don't so, even know. If, are we allowed to tell, talk about? No, that? Yeah. maybe not. I don't think we are. We can okay. we can kind of skirt around it. Well, so what we have, <laughs> we can skirt around it. This is we're, I think this we're is gonna have so to do another episode we're, on we're this. We're ahead of their press cycle here. No. You know, if you if you look at if you look at empathy at a core, and how do you unlock empathy in a human? You can unlock empathy in a number of ways through smell, right? Really through the senses. Mm -hmm. when you think about some we of your. We opened the fridge yeah. earlier today, and we had some empathy through <laughs> okay. smell. If you think about some of your, <laughs> we have to clean this up. <laughs> if you think about some of your most cherished memories as a kid, and you'll go back to those memories because of sight, because of smell, and because of sound. Yeah, that's very Proustian, the smell, like you, you yeah. smell a, a, car like a carnival. I remember like, oh my gosh. And it takes you right back, yeah, right? right back it takes you right back to the corn dog. Corn dog, <laughs> corn dog, <laughs> corn dog. I love corn dog. <laughs> yeah, incredible. And what, what we, I don't think we've done well enough as an environmental community is really connects your music. Mm. Art and visual, visuals, you know, sensory explosion definitely yeah. tugs at the heartstrings as well. But how do, you, how do you connect with somebody in a way that makes them want to dance, right? It makes them want to sing, it makes them want to celebrate. So music is the great connector. It, it allows us to mourn, it allows us to celebrate, it allows us to create community. And so mm -hmm. how do we really evoke that in a way that Roger Payne did in 1970, you know, when he, he, he unleashed to the world the song of the humpback whales. Mm -hmm. And that created the Greenpeace Save the Whale movement and that help to protect the humpback whales and raise collective consciousness about the importance of sounds in the ocean mm -hmm. and marine mammals. And music is the easiest language to understand. Mm -hmm. Transcends. You know, we, we can all speak it no matter what language we speak. And mm -hmm. by the way, our... <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, and, and our whale has been singing. Yeah. Whales sing. And in fact, when we first discovered that whales were singing back during the Cold War, um, and that was finally a revelation for the public when we, as a public, acknowledged, realized, yeah. mm -hmm. acknowledged that they were also communicating and singing beautiful songs. It was the first time that we wanted to save them. It's the first time we connected with them. Yeah, it's not just this beast out there like, ooh, big, scary, dark thing. Now it's like, it's, yeah, it, yeah. it's a vehicle for empathy. Or, oh, yeah. 100%. Yeah. And, it, and it really did. It sparked mm -hmm. the Save the Whales movement, which was one of the first environmental movements of our of our modern time. So, so singing, music, all of that is definitely going to be uh, part of our mission mm -hmm. to, to build that in, in, in our community. And well, I think celebration too and, and delivering a positive message because we do get so mired in, oh my gosh, there's so many things to worry about yeah, in this the life. Ice caps are melting, the, yeah, there's the election which is... Coral reefs yeah, just yeah, the went coral reefs to down and, basket yeah. in Australia. And yet, there's also a lot of positivity that we can that we can help project. So I, I really would love to see your viewer. I'd love to see all of you out here share with us that your art, your photos, your music, your song, your dance, mm -hmm. and you can do that through the Lonely Well platform. Yeah. That's and, cool. and that's a way for us to get the word out about the really creative passion that exists. I will tell you, I, I have yet to miss 
on telling the story of the loneliest whale uh-huh. and having someone not go, holy oh. shit, <laughs> like, how I can I, I, just what got can chills. I do? <laughs> you, you know what, it's, it's also about honoring and appreciating our whale's unique voice. Yeah. Mm-hmm. A lot of times people are like, how do you know he's lonely? Maybe he's chilling, maybe he's just like this rugged individualism and he's just like, Going out there all on his own. It's Rambo. You, it's the whale Rambo. But but that's true too. There's a lot of people uh, out out there who are doing things their way. They have a unique voice, and they may feel a little bit different. But that's okay too. So we do encourage people to also share with us their unique voice, their, their artistic voice, which is might be a little bit weird and out there. And a lot of people may look at you sideways, and maybe they don't understand it quite yet. I've been there, you know. Mm-hmm. But Share it with us, and we'll understand you. You be part of our, our little weird family. My friend of mine, James Victoria, is a great designer. He's got this quote that says, whatever made you weird as a kid is what will make you great as an artist. <laughs> and I think that's like leaning into that individualism. Uh, I think that's a really nice sort of uh, juxtaposition to the, to the loneliness and the connectivity. Like, go ahead and let your, let your individualism fly and be out there. Um, Super powerful. Mm-hmm. We'll put you know, I'll put this everywhere I can for as long as I can, and, and uh, this show will live on for a very, very long time. So um, we'll know we'll be able to pay attention. Is there anything else you want to tell us about the Lonely Whale? We've got all the like the dot orgs. The anything else that you want to tell us about the Lonely Whale before we bounce? I, I think from my side is is stay tuned for some incredible ways to connect. You know we're. I think when this air is, we're going to be in the process of announcing some very exciting initiatives and ways for people to really get involved. I love getting the scoop. I'm not like a reporter, but I get the scoop. You did. Yeah. Yeah, And I got one of those scoops. This is the first time we've ever come out uh, as, you know, partners. Like, it's it's official now. Sweet. (laughs) There's no going back. Yeah, there's no going back now. Just forward. Um, Speaking of music, you got another music thing coming. Do you want to talk about Mm -hmm. that at all? Uh, The Skins? Yes. I always want to talk about the skins. I always want to talk about the skins. I, I don't even know how many years ago it was. You said, dude, you have to check this out. And I think you just sent me a WAV file or something on my phone. Mm-hmm. It was just this absolutely rocking. Like, describe the skins. I mean, it's, <laughs> I really wish I could share. The I, thing? I, I just can't share the music okay. right now because okay. they're working on a really, really special EP uh, that is is destined to come out uh, sometime in June, most likely. So just... I mean, uh, weeks. Like We're, gonna, mm-hmm. we're, we're yeah. airing this thing the 30th of May. You've asked for the last slot to be <laughs> as close as possible. Maybe the, the 29th and the 30th of May. Yeah, so, so I, I would just suggest to, you know, of course, follow at Lonely Whale. Sure. LonelyWhale.org. But also theskins.com and at the skins. Yeah. Because they are going to... They're gonna blow your mind. I mean, you knew them when they were yay high. Yeah, that, and you're so like, <laughs> and he's like, I'm managing a band. I'm like, you're a fucking movie star. What are you doing? And he's like, no, I'm serious. I'm managing a band. They're incredible. You have to check them out. And I sure as no, like, it was well, awesome. It was was you, it you 13? You know when you've discovered yeah. talent. Yeah. And I fell in love with them the first time I saw them, and they were still very young, so. They hadn't, you know, nobody had corrupted them yet. Yeah. And so I, I was able to, because I, you know, I don't need the money, you know, to make money out of management. I could literally just give them good advice and, and hopefully guide them in the right direction without any selfish interest. Um, and so now, many years later, they've evolved into this really incredible band who are going to release their first EP. And it, it really is truly special when... When they first, when you saw them on the show yep. many yep. years ago, yep. they were playing a very particular kind of music, and they have they have evolved into something that's truly special. I mean, it's. Well, you, does the EP have a name yet? No name. It's no got name. nothing. It's so fresh Ooh, and like, new. This is a scoop. But well, you know what you scoops. should do? What's that? Is you should maybe you should show a link. Put uh-huh. a link to their old stuff. Okay. And Maybe to the, the it was a sh- like when last time when you were on this oh, show. Yeah, the show. You yeah, show, when yeah. you were on the show, we showed I think the music video right. a little bit of it. Maybe yes, yes. Okay, so but maybe we'll link to a video or something like right in here ish. <laughs> right, maybe in this, exactly. And here. then, and then when the 
when the EP comes out, then we can update it with a little link ah. so that they can get a side-by-side -side comparison. Copy that. It's going to blow their minds. It's going to blow their minds. Mm -hmm. Mind blown. Mind blown. And how old are they now? So they're like, I don't want to like hang, because it's really about their musical talent, not their age, but it is a unique contrast between someone, they're, they're much they're younger. Still, they're, still, they're still young. They got a lot of life in them. They got yeah. a big future ahead of them. Uh, but what's really cool is they're all from Brooklyn. They all come out of Brooklyn. Uh, three of them are siblings, so they grew up together, in, and they have that. You know, I don't know what it is. They just they just lock in. I guess maybe it's because they had that sibling understanding. And um, I had the I had the, the the distinct pleasure of dining, oh, oh. in L.A. I, he's like, you should come have dinner with us. And I mean, it was like, first of all, I I felt so connected to these people. Like I, you know, I've got a young nephew. I don't have any kids, but. It was like I was at a table of my peers, and they're, these, they're yeah. like 16 and they're, 17. They're mm -hmm. special cats. Special. I mean, I always say they're, they're post-modern, they're post-racial, they're post-gender, they're, they're post-genre. like genre. They're like Whoa. some other post -genre. kind of... Post-genre. Yeah, I mean, their music is so cutting yes. edge and like next level. We should stop. So. We're overselling it at this point. <laughs> I, 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 I don't know if you can. I'm yeah. gushing. I'm All right. gushing. All right. No, no. no, but you know what's funny is you, you have this, the same experience I that did. everyone does. They are just really, you know, special, yeah. amazing people, you know, and I think that translates into their talent and their music and what they're communicating. But when they go on tour, because they're as of yet still, you know, poor musicians um, and they're on tour, they, they share a room and they they take the mattresses off and they, they sleep on the box springs <laughs> and the like you know they're slumming it like yeah. most musicians have to do in the in the yeah. early days. So you know I I try and ease their Offset their suffering their pain a little bit. So yeah. I call up friends that I know in cities they're going to be in and I say okay man, here's the deal, you're going to let this band the Skins stay at your house. There's five of them plus the the road manager and the driver. Uh, and they're gonna stay at your house, and then you're gonna call me the next day, and you're gonna thank me. <laughs> and my friend's like, uh, uh, okay. Uh, okay. Without fail, every, every day, the next day, they call me up, thank you, oh my God, those kids are so cool, they're so amazing. So, all right, they got a, they got a home in Seattle and in San Francisco. Yes. They, they got both of my places, so. They're staying with you? Sure. Cool. You got it. <laughs> hey, wait. I've got a basement, too. Oh, no. I want right. one or two of them. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to split them. Awesome. Well, let's put a bow on this thing. I want to say thank you both very much thank for you. your time. And it's our goal to get um, your word out there. Uh, thanks for the creativity and inspiration for all that you both do. Um, and we know where to follow you. We know all that stuff. So I want to ask you to recite it. Any final words? Should I sign them off? We good? That smile, that beaming smile. Gang sign. Gang right. sign. Gang sign. <laughs> Gang signs. Lonely whale. Pod sign. Pod. This My is posse. The, pod. the lonely. I got to try and get this. Is the left hand is the yeah. whale. Lonely whale. L W. All right. You got it. In the house. Mm. <laughs> Woo. Thanks a lot. Signing off. Another one of these videos. Actually, this might be the last video. So I don't know if I can say this. That you can get another video tomorrow because this might be the last one in the series. We don't know. Check it out. Thirty Days of Genius on Creative Life. Thanks so much. I'm Chase. And you know these folks, these guys are the, these are the fancy pants. So have a great one, signing off. <laughs> <laughs>